away free storage and make it so that people can make access, to, uh, give access to this. And there was um, the guy, uh, John Eisen, who was um, just out of co college, who was writing our first website, uh, he said, you know, there is this community that trades tapes <laughs> of, 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 of concert recordings. Wow, I remember that. I have my Grateful Dead tapes and, you know, had all the, 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 um, the, the, the notations that are exactly perfect of exactly what song was leading into what, how long they were, and all that, the whole thing. Um, but I hadn't thought about it for, uh, for, for a long time. He said, yes, it's, it's, it's going on on the internet now, and they're having trouble. They're having trouble. So these are um, tapers that have been taping over the years, and they've been putting them online, but they would put them up, they'd send an email out to the E-Tree list, and they'd say, this concert is available on this MTP site, this is 2002, um, and people would sort of huddle in and, and start to grab that show until the system administrator at that university went, oh my god, somebody's using the internet, shut it down, and they shut it down. Um, and this would just, so there'd be this pop-up, then it's gone. So he said, Brewster, why don't we do something about this? And you, you, you've talked about this. I said, okay, go ahead. Write them an email. So he wrote them an email to this E-Tree list. Would you like unlimited storage, unlimited bandwidth, forever, for free? <laughs> <laughs> the email came back um, from the Taper community. They said, we don't believe you. <laughs> But if you could do it, it would be our dream. <laughs> um, when somebody says it would be our dream, it's always a good thing to try to pursue. He said, well, work with us. And we thought, okay, it would be different to go and uh, just put up these trader-friendly bands on a website than it was for tape trading. Let's see if we can get some level of, of um, uh, okay from the bands. And it turns out that it's been going along beautifully and well. Two or three bands a day have been signing up for the last 15, almost 15 years uh, now, um, and we now have 6,000 bands and 130,000 concerts available for free on the internet. On All of this is going on during the time when there were lawsuits, and there was the RIA suing grandmothers. It was, it was a bad time. Um, where a lot of people were pointing fingers and it was, it was difficult times, but there were people that wanted to make these things available. There, uh, the fans were, uh, the, the fans were up for going and doing a lot of the lead work, and it was working. It was a mechanism of coming up with a balance in this whole arena that was starting to look kind of ugly and lawsuit heavy. Well, we thought, what would be the shining light in our world at the Internet Archive, we thought that we should go back to the pioneers of sharing, the Internet heroes in our world. And we thought, let's start an award. And so I'm very happy to say we're awarding our very first Internet Archive Hero Award to the Grateful Dead that started the company.
successful to take money from his interest. And that's that's kind of an insane thing to think. Uh, I mean, it certainly was an insane thing to think when we both started thinking it. <laughs> what, 1985 or something like that? When 2% of the people on the planet had uh, email addresses of that. Uh, and I, I took a huge amount of heat from saying that I thought that the, that the internet, and I, by that I went back to what hath God brought moment of, of telegraphy, but, but that the internet was going to be the most important technological event in human history since the capture of fire. And people hooted. Uh, I don't think they hoot so much anymore when somebody says something like that. Because it's really happening. Uh, but along the way, there were many, many precursors as the, the nervous system of the noosphere, the nervous system of the collective organism of mind that is growing this knowledge together, has started to wire itself up. And one of the ways in which that was happening was more, you know, quite recently, but still, uh, massively was when uh, the deadheads, the followers of the Grateful Dead, started taping our concerts. And at the time, uh, Warner Brothers, who was still recording us, uh, informed us that this was happening and that they were stealing something from us. We couldn't actually figure out what it was. <laughs> <laughs> that they were stealing, uh, or if stealing was the right thing to say was happening to it. I mean, it, it seemed like, for one thing, radio in that case had been stealing for a long time. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, many record companies have been involved in payola scandals where they were actually paying radio stations to play uh, these songs which people could then listen to for free. But more to the point, you know, we never played the same concert twice, and uh, it wasn't as though there was any kind of competition with with the recorded the studio recordings because they had their own existence independently. And besides, as everybody nodded, uh, we're not in it for the money. Which was easy to say since there wasn't it <laughs> at that point. Uh, and what we didn't realize what we were doing was inventing viral marketing. Uh, you know, I, I really believe that that's honestly the case. It was it was entirely by accident, but I think that's basically what happened. Uh, and the deadheads started recording. I mean, we said they could stay with their tape decks and they started to record all those concerts and you know there are I think I think 2339 concerts that got played by the Grateful Dead you know and not the other ones the dead or you know the the various post Jerry manifestations and all but 300 of those are here in the archive. Okay. And you know, and I'm hopeful that you know somewhere in the eventual sound of my voice are people that that haven't uploaded their favorite tapes yet. And they're moldering them back in the closet, <laughs> and you'll get them up online before you know before it gets any later. Uh, but, so Brewster calls me up, and I've known Brewster since, <laughs> it's just funny, uh, Brewster cre created something called Waze. How many people in here can remember Waze? <laughs> yeah, it's a very, very small number. <laughs> well, Waze was an attempt to index cyberspace. 
uh, you know, a long time, you know, at a, at a point when it was, it was conceivable to create an index table where everything was online. Uh, not a sustainable model, but nevertheless. Uh, and he, had, he was working for Thinking Machines uh, at that time. Uh, and he produced a version of it that got ported over to the next, and I had a next machine. And it didn't, it didn't actually work, and I, I mean, or it was kludgy, and it wasn't Brewster's fault. It was the guy that put it on the next. But I started hammering Brewster about how he needed to fix this and that, thinking that he was like Microsoft or something. <laughs> and finally, I got something back from him. Only time I've ever seen it really irritating. <laughs> I said, Who are you and why are you giving me all this crap about something I didn't do? <laughs> and we've been fast friends ever since. <laughs> but uh, another great moment in our history of friendship was when he called me up and he said, Well, as you might expect, the Deadheads are space forever and you know this is this is like deadhead Valhalla <laughs> you know, that it would all be there I mean I don't know how many versions how many versions of Cassidy do you suppose you've got okay. I think you could play Dark Star for 24 hours yeah <laughs> <laughs> truly and uh, well a lot of people do that you know just with the same one <laughs> <laughs> That's their point. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, he said, I, I, uh, I feel like I need to talk to somebody. I mean, uh, the, somebody in the band or some, somebody, uh, you know, sort of nominally uh, in the band. Uh, somebody really in the band, somebody who gets up there and has to sweat bullets and possible, you know, assassination and whatnot. Uh, so, did I, maybe I should ask the lawyers. Oh, don't ask the lawyers. <laughs> don't ask anybody. <laughs> well, how about I said, no, no. Don't ask them. I mean, because, as Garcia once said, the Grateful Dead is the storehouse of a, a broken dream. Because everybody that had a great idea at some point would have shot down before they were really got at it, except for trip to Egypt, which was kind of a flu, but uh, I said, if they know about it, they're going to go into a ring ring of argument, and, and it won't get anywhere, and in the meantime, they'll, take, they'll force you to take all that stuff off, and I, I said, let's just leave it be until a huge amount has been uploaded, and the deadheads have kind of started using it as a resource. Uh, and are attached to it and will just go ballistic when somebody tries to take it down. Uh, and besides, I've always felt that it's better to apologize and ask permission. So uh, that was what we did, and, and it was, as I predicted, about a year and a half to two years before anybody from the band noticed. And then, <laughs> then, there were some of them that freaked out. <laughs> no question about it, including my official best friend, who I was hoping would be here tonight. Uh, though uh, he's, he's almost always got some road manager telling him what day of the week it is. And he found himself, as he put it, in another part of the space-time continuum, <laughs> which is Stinson Beach. <laughs> right. Which is true, actually. Uh, and uh, didn't make it in, and I, I'm sorry for that because he still disagrees with what became our policy with the internet right now. Uh, and that is that, that you know Phil, Bob Hunter, and I uh, felt very strongly that this was a perfect continuity between the policy that we'd set forth. First in a de facto way, and then, and then it actually 
set out uh, quite seriously uh, a few years later, uh, which was that if anybody was making non-commercial use of that material, uh, then it was okay to share. Yay! Share, share. Yay. share. You know, I was I was present for the founding uh, discussions of Creative Commons, and we had uh, the dead example had a lot to do with it. The idea of non-commercial sharing and, and the success of non-commercial sharing. I mean, I, I firmly believe, you know, and, and I think that even my old pal Weir would admit that had it not been for all those tapes, and the, the spreading by not just word of mouth, but here, here, you know, we would have gone the way of Quicksilver, Medicine, uh, Quicksilver Messenger Service. You know, there were a lot of good bands in the 60s that didn't make it because they didn't create this absolutely rabid and deep religious fan base, and that was based on those tapes. And, you know, and then, you know, they, they, they started to get kind of a baseball statistician's obsession. I don't get it, but <laughs> obsession with the song order. Well, actually, I do get it. I mean, it's, uh, we didn't have set lists, so, you know, to a very large extent, the band that's out in the audience would determine the next song. And they knew that. So this was like the, this was the only thing that they could you know, point to as a religious or religious light connection with their holy phenomenon. And uh, so then you had Stu Nixon who was here tonight. I'll talk, I'll talk more about what, what is going to happen here. But Stu and his, and his two buddies started up something called Dead Base, which was an aid to these people, where they were they were writing down, a, you know, I think at this point, with a quill pen. Uh, they were writing down every single song that was played at every single concert, and getting records, you know, getting just the, the metadata, so to speak, on all of the great Dead Bates. And, uh, and creating something called Dead Base, which now weighs, what is it, Stu, uh, 33 pounds? <laughs> something like that. What's that? Seven pounds. Oh, well, sure. Jeez. I guess. This is, I had, a, I had a crippling event take place in April, and, you know, seven, 33, they're both heavy as far as I'm concerned. That's <laughs> so. But uh, in any case, uh, the real deal was what was set with the Deadheads and the Argo. What was set with the Deadheads to begin with, which is, which is having a community bond together and do something that could not possibly been accomplished by a single person, or, a, or even a group of people, uh, or even any, any organized set of, of endeavors, doing this as a community. And, you know, it pointed the way in my mind, and Brewster's, I think, about how it was going to be possible to realize that dream that they gave us on the Flying Saucer. You know? Uh, so, so I'd like to wrap up. Oh, okay. Sorry. I beg your pardon. Uh, well, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me quickly, let me quickly cut to the final end of the chase, which is that, that, uh, one loses track of time. I thought there was going to be a clock out here. Just said zero, 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 zero. So, uh, anyway, uh, the, the thing is that we now, as Brewster said, have 6,000 bands that have found that it is in their best economic interest as it was in ours. Uh, and certainly in the interest of posterity to put their 120,000 concerts online that you know, we have a community of people, large community of people, that is dedicated not just to our music, but to 
lot of people are using. You know, this endeavor is going to require the participation of just about everybody in the human race. Unfortunately, that's what it's got coming to. Thank you. Thank you.